three tools of the enemy that he uses against us, fear, guilt, and shame. And let's identify the original. It's important to identify the source, the sources of this. What is, is, is basically from what happened in the Garden of Eden. Before that, man had no shame because he had no reason to be ashamed. Man had no fear because he had no reason to be afraid. Man had no guilt because he had no reason to be guilty. No shame, no fear of any sort before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And if Christ has come to restore us back to something, like we've always mentioned, then it's important to understand what he has come to restore us back to. Man knew no shame, apparently, before the fall. He was, for example, he was stuck naked and didn't see anything wrong with it because he knew nothing about shame. We be, he became aware of shame for the first time after eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> and notice the word, the words, he became aware. He became aware. Because shame particularly is an awareness and a perception. Praise the Lord. Shame, and the same thing applies to guilt and fear. But basically talking about shame, it's an awareness, first of all, and a perception. So these three things are basic effects or the components of the fruit that Adam and Eve ate in the Garden of Eden. Shame, shame, guilt, and fear. So first of all, it's a tree. It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means that if it's a tree, it has many branches. It has fruit. It's important to be aware that if it's a tree, then it has to be seen as a system. We must understand it as a system with several faculties and branches and departments. It has many, it's a big system. It's a system of the devil. That's what he came to advertise to Adam and Eve. And what he himself became out of his rebellion against God being cast out of heaven. So this tree is a system and this tree is an embodiment of every kind of corruption. So when the head of this tree, basically what changed was not external, it was internal. It wasn't the nakedness that was really the problem then. It was their perception of it. Now, that, that, that is something to really understand. It wasn't the nakedness that was the problem. It was their perception of it. Because nothing changed externally. Everything that changed, glory to God, was internal. So when they started to cover up, it was a bad symptom, a symptom of change of perception. Glory to God. And when we understand this, we would understand then that shame is then is not really a physical condition. It's not about a physical condition, but a perception. It's not really about our condition, but our perception of it. Glory to God. It's not really our condition that's the problem. It's how we see it that, that makes it we're either shameful or not shameful. You can be in a condition or situation and consider it shameful. And another person can be in the same condition and they don't consider it shameful. It's all a matter of perception. Glory to God. And it's when we understand, the, we're, we're, getting, we're getting to this from its root. Wow, what, how, what is it? What's the root of shame? It was a change of perception from the inside. And when we understand this then, that it is just a matter of perception, not a condition, but a perception. Glory to God. Then we understand we have the power to determine our perspective in every situation. We have the power to disempower others.
from defining our situation for us. People have no power over us except the one we give to them. Things have no power over us except that which we give to them. Glory to God. We have been empowered to, listen to this, we have been empowered to disempower people's thoughts and opinions about us. And not just that, but we have been empowered to, to, to be empowered only by God's thoughts about us. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He said in his word, my thoughts towards you are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a hope and to give you an expected end. To bring you to an expected end. What a wonderful power we have been given to choose our own perspectives irrespective of what anybody thinks of it. What a power we've been given to choose our perspectives and to choose to see ourselves only the way God sees us. Because it's not, my goodness, your identity is not, is not down to the opinions of people. It is down to God's opinion. And God's opinion is how he, de he designed you according to his opinion about you. He already created you in his image and nothing is going to change. Glory to God. That is not about to change. So being good enough is already, you're already good enough in God's eyes and that is not about to change. Nothing, nobody can call God to a meeting and suggest to him that you are different than what he knows that you already are. My goodness. So shame is only a matter of perception. You can choose your perspective. Since what happened to Adam then and Eve at the Garden of Eden happened internally, the external condition was just the same before and after the fall. Their perception of their physical condition was what changed. Nothing really changed. Adam and Eve changed. This means we have to be careful because Perception is more powerful than we think. Nothing changed. They changed. <laughs> Nothing was shameful about being naked. They changed. Nothing was shameful about their condition. They changed. Their condition didn't change. They changed. Hence, it changed their condition, condition because they changed. Their perspective changed. My goodness. Our perspective has a way of changing our condition. For good or for bad. My goodness. Our perspective can change our condition from good to bad, and it can change it from bad to good. It's in fact bad or good, some most times it's just about perception. Thank you, Jesus. One of the most significant things that happened out of eating that fruit is that the knowledge of good and of knowledge of evil was that shame got introduced to man's DNA. Fear, guilt, and shame all gained access. We started deriving our sense of validation and affirmation from external things outside of God. Looking good became more important than being good. And God's acceptance of us was no longer enough in our eyes. We needed acceptance from other sources. God, not, God, God became insufficient, yet he is Jehovah our sufficiency. I can't, I'm trying to remember the, that particular name in, in Hebrew. Um, but more than enough, I think that's El Shaddai. No, uh, yeah, more than enough, sufficient, the all-sufficient one. He, he, he was no longer the all-sufficient one in their eyes. So for affirmation, for self-image, for validation, what God would on enough, God was no longer the source of that affirmation. It was no longer sufficient in their eyes. Thank you, Jesus. So they started seeing what they couldn't see before and 
things started taking a new meaning. I mark the word meaning because it was the same thing with a new meaning. The same nakedness with a new meaning. The same condition with a new meaning. They saw themselves differently. Their bodies meant something different to them. My goodness. They didn't feel any, they didn't feel ashamed before. Suddenly they started to feel ashamed. Shame is not a condition, it's a perception and a feeling. Shame is mostly about how we feel about it, not what it is. They didn't feel naked. Now they feel naked. Things took a new meaning. For the most part, things only has the meaning that we give it. For the first time, a separation occurred and a discrepancy occurred between what something means to God and what it meant to them. Before then, they saw their condition the same as God saw it. God didn't think there was anything embarrassing or shameful about them being naked. But after the fruit, they, there was a departure. They no longer see things the way God sees it. They no longer saw themselves the way God saw them. Glory to God. And this is it. The work of redemption of Christ at the cross is to restore us back to seeing ourselves the way God sees us. What has he done? He has removed shame. The Bible says he bore our griefs, he bore our shames, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we have been healed, not only of physical diseases, but of every emotional disease, of everything that shame and guilt and fear put on us. We have been healed. We have been delivered from guilt, delivered from condemnation, delivered from every kind of regret, de delivered from the fear of the future, delivered from the regret of yesterday, and now we have been restored back to joy, restored back to peace, irrespective of the situation, peace of God that passes no understanding, and that passes all understanding, restored back to power, restored back to love, restored back to a sound mind that is not dependent on anything that is happening around us. Galatians 3, 13 to 14 says, Christ has redeemed us. Notice the word half. It's not to say it's going to. It's not a futuristic tense. It is not, uh, it's not uh, a present continuous tense. It doesn't say he's redeeming us. It says he has. He has. Christ has redeemed us. Already did it. My goodness. It's already done from the cause of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, crosses everyone the haggard of the three, that the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Christ, that we might receive the promise of the faith of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3, 13 to 14. He has redeemed us. Glory to God. And how did he do it? I love this part. The penalty for sin and death. For, first of all, the penalty for sin is death. So he died. My goodness. Uh, and he died not just as, as God, but as a man. I, he died as a sinless man. My goodness. He died as one of us on behalf of all of us. Oh, yes, that's what he did. Which one of us, uh, uh, when, I mean, it, it, it practically means that when one of us sinned, all of us sinned. My God. So then when one of us died, all of us died. <laughs> My goodness. And when he was raised, one of us was raised, all of us were raised. My goodness. Now that he's seated at the right hand of God, we are seated with him. Christ, as believers in Christ, the Bible says we are jointly seated with Christ at his right, at the right hand of God. My goodness. If you look in Romans 3, 23, Romans 5, 12, and Romans 5, 17 to 19 particularly, it says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. How much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Oh, I love that part. By one Jesus, my Jesus, my, by one Jesus Christ, therefore as by the offense of one judgment of one, judgment came upon all men 
to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one man, the free gift came unto all men, unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, uh, glory to God, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That's what he did, my goodness. So still on how he did it, uh, look at this. He showed up in hell as a sinless man and in death as a sinless man and in the grave as a sinless man. And after his blood had been shed, hell realized it was not the kind of blood that was admissible in hell. Oh, is somebody getting this? This is sinless blood. His blood samples didn't match what they were allowed to admit and keep in their inventory. I don't know if anybody is getting blessed by this. This really blessed me. It, 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 his blood sample didn't match what was allowed to be kept in their inventory. This is a sinless soul. This is the kind of... This kind of soul is not admissible in hell. So there's a problem. Hell had made a mistake. And at the same time, the penalty for sin has been paid. It's like the kind of federal prison where, or state prison, finding out that they had the wrong inmate and that they had the wrong guy. And the Bible says, if the princes of this world knew, they would not have crucified with him. 1 Corinthians 2.8 which one of these princes of the world knew they would not have crucified the king of glory? So they mistakenly arrested someone and had the power of authority. Now, this is they mistakenly arrested someone that had the power and authority to set all prisoners free because he willingly submitted himself to them so that he can shed his blood and pay the payment and gain access to set all prisoners free. And not just the present prisoners, it includes all future arrests for anyone who would flash the Jesus ID. Mm -hmm. nice. My goodness, if they arrested you, all you had to do is flash the Jesus badge and they have no authority and no hold on you. Now you have power over sin, not just sin then, but everything that sin produced. Part of it is guilt. Part of it is shame. Part of it is fear. Part of it is condemnation. You have been set free. You have been set free. And many people don't understand. Many people understand redemption conceptually but not in practical application to their present situation and what's the application of to your present situation you don't have to be ashamed anymore because christ has delivered you from shame christ took all your shame away there is therefore romans 8 one says right now there is therefore now no condemn my goodness it's either this is true or not. And God cannot lie. It says there is therefore now no condemnation, no shame, no guilt, nothing because Christ bore it. He took it. I, I cannot give Chica my iPhone and still have it. One of us has to have it. If he took my shame and he took my guilt, then I no longer have it. It's now hanging on the cross of Christ where he took it away forever and ever and ever, never to bring it back. I don't, we can't get it back because he took it away. There is therefore now. And it's not talking about something futuristic. It's not talking about something back then. It's talking about now. The word now means now there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, if you have made Jesus your Lord and Savior, there is no condemnation for you in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. You have been set free. God is not in the process of redeeming you. God has redeemed you. He is not really restoring you. He has restored you back to the right status. He's not delivering you. He has delivered you. What you need is to see it and begin to walk in it. What you need is a thinking that matches the new status and your new identity in Christ. 
the identity that was given to you as a gift of God in Christ that Christ has put you into. It's your new identity. God is not trying to make you into something you are not. He's trying to get you to see what you already are and his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. 